lovely to um, be welcomed on to this place and we, we stand in our history here. Yeah? We stand recognising Octavius Hatfield and we also stand and I acknowledge those people uh, particularly who have gone before us but particularly who have gone before us recently. So I admit to, um, to uh, Joe and Graham of Te and I admit to them and also we remember Linda and her whanau uh, in Christchurch. And also we remember the farmer and particularly young Finn who's 18 years old and passed away at the cathedral uh, just tragically on the weekend. And so we remember those people and so we gather here. As we gather, what I felt like I really wanted to do is to set the scene for why we why we're here together. Is I thought that actually Archbishop Brown Tudor his charge at General Synod was phenomenal. I don't know how many of you were at General Synod, but his charge was, um, was the most remarkable charge I think I've heard. And so what I want to do is, um, if, you, if you bear with me, I would like to read his charge to us again today. Um, I apologise, um, I would get somebody else with a better voice to read his charge, but this is on my phone. Uh, I don't think anybody else will be able to read the font because it's so tiny. Um, so apologies for that. But I. Um, I think this, this charge um, sets the scene so well for the journey that we are on over these days. Uh, stick with me. This is Archbishop Brown Pudo's charge to us, this general synod, the most remarkable general synod. On Christmas Day 1814 at Ohia in the Bay of Islands, Samuel Marsden stood before a pulpit to preach the first Christian sermon on Aotearoa soil. And speaking from the second chapter of the Gospel of Luke, he said, I bring you glad tidings of great joy. These words are our Gospel beginnings and our inheritance. I bring you glad tidings of great joy. Of course, these English words would not have been understood 
by the Māori audience, if not for the assistance of the famed Ngāpuni chief, Ruatara. We all know that Ruatara translated Samuel Marsden's sermon for the Māori audience and probably deserves as much credit as Marsden for preaching that day. What is not so well known is that Ruatara himself built the platform, the seating, the reading desk and the pulpit that Marsden used to deliver the gospel that day. You could say that's been a work of generations of Māori ever since, providing a platform for the delivery of the gospel. Māori gifted thousands of acres of land, donated materials and raised funds to build mission stations and churches and encircled the settler church even while impoverishing themselves. Such was their belief in the promise of the gospel. I bring you glad tidings of great joy. The gospel that Marsden and Ruatara preached began to flourish in Aotearoa. Entire Māori communities took up the faith and joined together with the burgeoning numbers of settlers in sharing and preaching the gospel. Within four decades of that first sermon, the church had spread far and wide and the congregations grew immensely. In 1857, the church formally adopted a constitution that arranged the church with structure and hierarchy. Sadly, this was done without Māori input or inclusion, even though Māori formed the majority of the Anglican congregation in Aotearoa at the time. Dioceses such as Waiapu sought to retain close and just relationship with Māori in their regions with Waipu, Waipu notably holding its first four synods entirely in the Māori language. However, as Māori inclusion decision-making bodies diminished, so did the inclusion of their language, their culture, and the memory of the generous gifts of land and support that helped to establish the church in Aotearoa. I bring you glad tidings of great joy. It was not until 1860, some 46 years after that first sermon, that the first Māori Anglican priest would be ordained. His name was Rota Waitoa, and it took much tenacity and patience on his part before the church came to allow a Māori to be priested. It was not until 1928, some 114 years after that first sermon, that the first Māori bishop was ordained. His name was Frederick Augustus Bennett, and he was to be a bishop suffragan, ministering subject to the permission of part of our diocesan bishops and holding no voting rights at General Synod. Both Rota and Frederick were paid less than their Pākehā counterparts, with, their prevailing, with the prevailing logic being that Māori could and should sustain themselves from their own land. I'm sure the irony was not lost on Māori at the time. It was not until 1978 that the bishopric of Aotearoa was formally recognised by the church, and it was not until 1981 that the bishop of Aotearoa was recognised as a bishop in full standing. It was also the first time that the bishop of Aotearoa was elected by his own Māori people. Prior to this, the bishop of Aotearoa was chosen by the three Pākehā diocesan bishops in the North Island. And so it was in 1992 through a revision of the constitution of the church that the bishopric of Aotearoa became fully autonomous and able to order itself according to its own tikanga and values. It had only taken 178 years, many prayers and much struggle after that first sermon, but Māori were able to say, I bring you glad tidings of the church morning. In my 65 years as an ordained minister, I have witnessed this church changing and growing. The church I grew up in had much in common with the church that Master and Ruatara founded. We held fast to the 1662 Book of Common Prayer and the majesty of its Māori language version, the Rawi. We stayed true to the authorised version of the Holy Scriptures, the Venerable King James Version of the Bible, first completed in 1611. Since then, I have seen rapid change and growth in the church. More change and more growth than I think Mars and Ruatawa could ever have imagined. We have new liturgies, new prayer books, and dozens of new versions of the Bible. We have new ways of ministering, new ways of being, and new ways of preaching the gospel. 
These changes haven't always come easy. For the most part, they've been fraught with tension and misunderstanding. But the loom of the gospel has continuous work and woven us together, strength by strength, through war and weave, and held us together in tension. I have seen many wonderful things in my time. This includes the first Māori bishopric and the joy of Māori as they've been free to worship in their own language and culture. They are, their joy too at being included once more in the decision-making bodies of the church. Who would have thought in my day, in those early days, that one day there would be a Māori Archbishop? It was almost inconceivable in those early days, and yet there, and yet there was Sir Paul Reeves and Sir Atahui Rivirko, and of course, let alone me. I bring you the glad tidings of great joy. There is great joy in our gospel history. Occasionally we got things wrong. More often than not, we got things right. Eventually. We still have a lot of work to do. We need to pray with each other, discuss with one another, and listen to God. Let us not be afraid to challenge and change in the ways that our forebears did. Perhaps if we learn from their example, we will come to a place where we can say, in Christ we move forward together. And perhaps then we could turn to each other and say with all hope and sincerity, I bring you glad tidings of the future. What we are about in these three days, especially as Tikhana Park is is we're recognising that we are not complete in this land. And this we have a living relationship with Tante Fiona, with Māori. That by definition, Pākehā only exists because of Māori. We are only truly who we are in this land because of our relationship to Māori. And we, for many years, I think, as a diocese particularly, we have avoided this, we have in many cases and put it in the too hard basket and have stepped back. But this hui is about us leaning in, about us choosing as a diocese to lean in. And we are going to push in to our relationship. We are going to push in to this church. Because we recognise we can only be fully God's people as Tikanga Pākehā while we're in a relationship to Tikanga Māori under God. And then in order for us to be found in that, we need to push it. And for many of us, um, you know, it's, it's a bit scary and we haven't been on this journey before. We're not quite sure how it works out. And actually, you know, since 1992, we maybe haven't done much. But that's all right. That's all right. We can win together. We can push them together. And, uh, and, and that's fine. And here's the thing. Here's the thing. If we don't push it, we'll never know who we are as God's people in this place. So while we choose to stand back and, and live in fear and live in doubt and live in, live in sort of, of uh, sort of an ambivalence, we actually never will know who we really are in God and who God created us to be. So actually, although it's a bit scary for some of us maybe, actually the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. And we can push it on that. And you know, as we push it on these three days, and as we push it as a diocese and lean in going forward, and as we try to discern what is God doing amongst us, you know, we'll make lots of mistakes. And we've not like we haven't made 200 years of mistakes to part out. You know, and people will be gracious and we'll make some more mistakes and we'll take some responsibility. But as we go on this journey, it's fine to make mistakes. I, I remember um, uh, 20 years ago, I remember when I uh, met Tama Iti, we all know Tama Iti now, uh, the very famous activist who was in the paper the other day. Well, I met him um, over 20 years ago, and uh, he won't remember me, by the way. Uh, but let me, tell you, uh, let me tell you how I met him. Uh, it's just about the same time as I met Sam Chapman, and she's very, very some time in my life. And uh, me and Jenny had taken a group of young people up to um, Ruatoki up in Tuwood country. And we 
gone up here, staying there, the host of like the young people up here, and we were staying on a marae and we were talking, etc. And um, one day um, uh, we, we decided to go on a, a trip, and somebody said, Look, the local, local um, iwi who were hosting us said, Well, why don't you guys go and visit um, these protest marae's on the hill? Because there had been a whole lot of um, logging done by Future Challenge on the hills. And so they put, they'd set up um, this protest mill out there. And so what happened is um, we as a group of our young people and the youth leaders, we took our young people and we, were, we, were, we went up to one of these protest mill and it just so happened that um, Tama Eti was the person welcoming us on. Back then, he wasn't particularly famous, but it was Tama Eti. And I remember we came up to this marae and, um, we, went, and we went through a, a profiting process very similar to what we, we have been through today. And the um, co martyr who was with us, um, Wuli Kahika, who's now passed on, um, Wuli Kahika said to me, which was really, really bad, he said, Oh, can you speak for us? Now, um, my, as you've heard, my Māori is very, very um, limited. Pigeon Māori, probably, is what you call it. And so he asked me to speak on behalf of us. And I, and I felt really um, ill equipped, not just due to my limited today, but also due to the fact that I was kind of a bit scruffily dressed and all I had was a sort of like a t-shirt that I had from running marathons, like a marathon t-shirt or something like that. Very underdressed. So, so um, Tamaliti got up and, and he, he uh, spoke and, uh, and, and introduced in some senses the, the co-pup of the, these, um, these protests that I about future challenge logging, etc. and laid down the wheel really. Really appropriate. Then I stood up to uh, talk in my pigeon Māori and floundering as I did it, and everybody started laughing. And I, and I know my Māori's bad, but, but, but this was really bad. People were just laughing and laughing and laughing. And so I quickly sort of get to a Nōreira and jump and sit down as fast as I can. And, and somebody, somebody leans over and says to me, Look at your t shirt. And I looked at my t shirt and said, Fletcher Challenge Marathon. <laughs> <laughs> we'll all make mistakes. <laughs> we'll all make mistakes as we be in. But that's fine. That's fine. Because we will find who we are truly meant to be in God as a church. And if we don't do it, we never will. And so I want to again just um, thank Tika uh, Māori for your graciousness in inviting us and being a part of our hui and, and, and actually kind of um, uh, creating, obviously, and creating the, the basket that holds us over these three days and the basket so lovely holds us. So I thank you for that. And can I encourage us all, um, you know, this is just our next step in the journey. This is just our next step. We'll take a next step, and a next step, and a next step. And it's an exciting journey. And like all of our journeys at the moment as a diocese, yes, it is into the unknown for many of us. But we're getting good at that. And we can journey into the unknown one more time. And so let's make the most of these three days. And the three days is not about learning this. It's about building relationships and transforming this. Okay, so at the end of the three days, you're not going to be tested on can you do the Lord's Prayer, all that detail, all that is very important. But what you will be asked is, have you built relationships? And has your heart heard again what it means to belong and not to belong? Okay? Just to kind of think again, just look for, the, look for what God's saying everywhere as we do these three days. Um, we had a lovely presentation from um, Te Wārana o Rokawa. i tell you what stood out um, to me. Is here's this place that is built on the determination and the vision of people to see the treasures of old revived again. Mm. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? They did it. They're doing it. They're reviving the treasures of old by determination, by working together, by dreaming the impossible dreams. We've got a lot to do today. What a great place to live. So no data mattia to cut a minaki tiaki minawa cut or tin